Good morning. How are we all doing today? Good. I was up here last night doing my normal kind of run through on my sermon, but the chairs most, mostly are still facing that way, and the stage wasn't here. So I went ahead and practiced over there, and I have to tell you, it kind of spooked me. <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. I hope that you're, you are excited to be here. This week, as you can tell, we're talking about Habakkuk chapter 2. Last week, in chapter 1, Habakkuk, if you remember, <clears throat> was asking God um, why he let so much evil go on in Judah. And God told him, um, well, I wasn't really going to tell you this, but since you asked, I'm bringing Babylon to judge Judah. And Habakkuk got very worried, very concerned, very anxious about this because Babylon is far more evil than they. And so he said, really, he, he said, really God, really, that's, that's your plan to fix this? And so, so he questioned God, not out of, out of anger or frustration, but out of genuinely wanting to know how God was going to answer him. And so we ended last week in chapter 2, verse 1, where he said, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Well, this week God answers Habakkuk. And as we tend to see him answer people in Scripture, he doesn't quite give Habakkuk, I think, quite the answer that he's expecting. <clears throat> because his answer to Habakkuk is basically, don't worry, Babylon's going to get theirs too. Not to negate what is coming, but Babylon has what is coming their way as well. And so this week we're going to look at God's response to Babylon because Habakkuk was right. Babylon is a highly evil nation. And so God answers Habakkuk in verse 2 where he says, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. <clears throat> Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not delay. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. God says, write this down because it's going to happen. And when it happens, people will, be, will look back and say, this is what God said. He says, make no mistake, this will come. He says, the wicked will fall, but the just shall live by his faith. This this part, this part of this verse, this, the just shall live by faith, is quoted three times in the New Testament. It's something many people are very familiar with. And so as we go through the rest of this chapter, I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Because we're going to be talking about a lot of wicked things, a lot of wicked practices. We're going to be talking about a lot of evil that we see in the world today. And so I want you to keep in mind that though the wicked will fall, those in faith will live. <clears throat> and so in verse 5, God gives kind of a, a general description of Babylon. And he says, indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges, his desire is hell. And he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. 
They cannot be filled. It's like me when I go to a Chinese buffet. <laughs> I need more. I want more. Give me more. Feed me more. Let me consume more. This is Babylon, except they do it with people. And they swallow them up. And so God is going to pronounce five woes upon Babylon. He's going to give them five warnings of impending judgment. And he's going to list out their big major sins, their big major evils, and tell them what's going to happen because of it. In verses 6 through 8, he brings the charge of them stealing. And God says, Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his, how long? And to him who loads himself up with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will, will they not awaken who oppress you? And you will become their booty because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. <clears throat> See, Babylon sees, sees the nation, sees what they have, and they want it for themselves. It's not theirs. And so they go, they conquer, they take over, and they take what they want. It's stealing. And God has a very serious problem with that. Usually when, when we think of stealing, we think of you know, stealing cars or, um, or fraud or robbing a bank. But stealing doesn't always come in the forms that we think of. I was listening to another preacher um, talk about stealing. And he brought up how many people steal from their work, steal from their jobs, steal from their bosses. And not things like, like staplers and pens, but time. And it's a problem in our society, society today. It is a growing problem in our society today. It used to be that to waste time at work, you either had to bring something in or go somewhere. Now it's, what's, what, what's the latest Facebook status update? What's the newest thing on Pinterest? I can't miss it. We have people on, on, the, on the site LinkedIn looking for other work while they're at their work. We have people stealing from creditors, taking out loans that they have no intention of paying back. Tax season is known for its theft. We're told to render under, under, unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. But, and yet, we have so many people out there who tax time comes around, and they, and they look for ways to cheat the system, to gain, gain the system. It's stealing. It does not just involve robbing banks and stealing cars. Now, there, there are, I, have, I know people and I have friends out there who have, who have gotten into debt and they're just, they're kind of in over the heads and they're trying to work out, you know, how, how they're going to get this all paid off. And so they'll, they'll put off something here in order, so they can pay these people. And when, they're, and when they're done, then they can move on to the next and move on to the next. That's one thing. That's trying to live responsibly and, and pay what you owe. But it's quite another when people try to short shift those who have given them what they wanted on, the, on their terms. And this is a serious thing in God's eyes. He calls out Babylon about their theft. <coughs> And he follows the accusation of theft with one of coveting. 
In verses 9 through 11, God says, Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. They covet, they, they see what is, what is not theirs, and they must have it. They want it. It must be theirs. It doesn't belong to them. They have no business having it. We see this in our society at large. Just turn on the TV, go to the mall. You must want this. You must have this. You must more, 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 more. It's consumerism. It's, it's, it's sale based on the desire of that which we do not have, whether or not we have any business having it and whether or not we can afford it. Very often those go together. We need to be careful especially as Christians and especially as Christians in our, in our modern Western world, that we do not fall into this trap. Because this trap says that if you get this, if you have this, you'll be happy. You'll be filled. And really all it does is drag us down, pull us down, either distract us away from God directly or work to make us want something else that will. And it's a trap. And it's one that we need to be aware of because there's only, there's only one that can actually bring us true joy and fulfillment and happiness. And that is our God and our Father above. He wants us to have good things. He wants us to know him. He wants us to have the best things. But we need to trust that he actually knows what those best things are better than we do. And so God moves on to the next woe. Where he accuses Babylon of murder. In verses 12 through 14, God says, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not the Lord of hosts that the people labor to feed the fire, and the nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. They're killers, they're murderers. In order to increase themselves, increase their stature, in order to become richer, stronger, more powerful, they will take out anyone they see fit. And they will do so brutally. Across our world today, we see rampant, rampaging murder. In the Middle East, we have ISIS executing Christians and selling them into slavery. In Africa, we have roaming gangs of warlords enslaving and taking over villages, cities, anything they can get their hands on. In the Western world, we tend to have a little more peaceful existence unless you're an unborn child. This is not a political issue. This is not. This is a moral issue. People want to say that abortion is a political football. It's political bomb throwing. It's not. I, I, I question talking about very controversial topics like this because it makes me nervous personally, but we need to have this conversation. We have hundreds 
of millions, hundreds of millions of people who have been killed in the womb. And this is not, <coughs> this is not, this is not just, just me speaking theologically. This is me speaking scientifically. Because according to science, according to scientists, life begins at conception. An individual human being is formed at conception. That's what science says. And not, and not, you know, the religious fringe science that says what they want. Normal, secular, run-of-the-mill, mainstream science says that life begins at conception. And if an individual, if that is when an individual life starts, then it is murder to destroy it. <clears throat> I have to wonder, with the latest videos that have come out, I'm sure 95% of people here have either seen them or heard of them, I have to wonder what context talking about selling unborn baby parts is okay. There's no context that makes that okay. The good news is, the good news is that we serve a God who is both loving, who is forgiving, who is, who cherishes all who come to him regardless of what has happened in their past. The good news is that we serve a God who not, who not only forgives sins that we consider small, but that he also forgives well, stealers and covetors and murderers. And we serve a God who is above and beyond all of that. I have had friends, I have had close friends who have had abortions. And they agree with this. And if we're going to be God's people, we need to be those people who show his love, who show his kindness, who show his care to the people who need it the most. Because they make no mistake, they need him desperately. We go beyond that to hatred. We have, we, have, we have the world, we have the word, word hatred just thrown around everywhere today. Everywhere. It doesn't matter if you say something in the nicest, kindest, most gentle, loving way in the world. You're considered a hater if, it's, if you say the wrong thing or if you're against the wrong issue. Do not let society tell you what is and is not hatred. Let God tell us what is and is not hatred. Hatred. And yet we have <clears throat> so many that get so wrapped up in the issues, so wrapped up and so, and, and so hooked on to, to issues that that's all they talk about, all they think about, and it comes off as very unloving. But let us not hold on to issues, but rather hold on to God and let him guide us in the hows and whys and wheres that we speak about things and talk about things and stand up for things. In verses 15 through 17, God's accusation against Babylon is that they are adulterers. He says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be, will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which, make, which made them afraid 
because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all who dwell in it. According to most scholars that I've read on, on these verses, he's talking about adultery. I don't know if, 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 it, if, it, if many of y'all heard this, but I think it was early last week, um, the site Ashley Madison was hacked, and the hackers were threatening to leak all the people that had signed into it. Ashley Madison is a website dedicated, the only purpose of it is to help you have a discreet affair behind your spouse's back. That's what it exists for. They had a, I believe they had a commercial in the Super Bowl a couple years back. Do not think that you are immune to this. The most dangerous position you can put yourself in is to say, that will never be a problem for me. I'm stronger than that. I will never be tempted that way. It will never be a problem. When you hear those words, when you find yourself thinking that way, watch out. Because that's when you stop letting down, that's when you let down your guard. That's when you stop guarding your back. That's when you stop guarding your heart. And your heart needs to be guarded. <laughs> Jesus says, do not Look after a woman to lust after her because if you do, it's adultery. And there was a time when I, I, I grew up just as the internet was, was coming in. Okay? Inter internet kind of came into mainstream existence when I was in junior high. Before that, the only way to access Pornography was to either go to a store with you know, sunglasses and a hat and a big coat or your, your friend's like, hey, come here, come here, I found something. It has become inundated, the internet, with pornography. And pornography is adultery, according to Jesus. And I'm going to take his word over, you know, mine. If you remember the big, the big brouhaha in the late 90s about whitehouse.com. White House, a, a bunch of kids were given an, were given an assignment to do a, a, a report on government. And some of them had the White House. So they type in whitehouse.com going looking for information. It was a pornography site. It seeks to undermine everything. It seeks to trap, it seeks to trick, and it will stop at nothing to make more of the billions upon billions upon billions of dollars that it makes today. You can't escape it. Even, even with, good, with good software, you can't escape it. We need... To, to realize that we are not immune. And we need to realize the importance of guarding our hearts for our spouses. This is serious stuff. I don't like giving most, you know, big, heavy, serious sermons, but this is serious stuff and it needs to be talked about. And so the final woe, the final warning of judgment to Babylon is in verses 18 and 19 where he warns them against their idolatry. And he says, What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols? Woe to him who says to wood, Awake! And to silent stone, Arise! It shall teach! Behold, it is overlaid with, sil with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. <laughs> Babylon was filled with idolatry. I mean, filled with idolatry. 
They worship their idols like we worship our sports. They, ooh, I said it. <laughs> they worship their idols like we worship our children. They worship their idols like we worship our government affiliation. They worship their idols like we worship ourselves. Idolatry is not just some weird ancient stuff that, oh, look at those, look at those goofballs over there worshiping a statue. Ha <laughs> ha, that's nothing to do with us. Except it does. We are not masters. We are servants. And we live for the one true king above all else. We have no time for idols. Yes, we are, we are given things that we can be blessed with, things that we can enjoy, things that we can um, really, really like. I have lots of things I really, really like. But we do not have time to put those things on the throne that God belongs on. Remember, remember I said to keep verse 4 in mind as we go along. That the wicked will perish, but the just will live by faith. This is how God ends, or rather this is how, this is how he ends his statement. In verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. This is how we live. We can live by faith. We can have life by faith because the Lord is in his temple, because he is over all, because all things keep silent before him. We can live by faith. We have life by faith. And there are many parts of, of living by faith. We, we, we've talked about it since we were little children, what it, what it means to live by faith. We read in James that faith without works is dead. A, a faith that has no life is a dead faith. And can a dead faith save? But in Habakkuk, what does faithful living look like? In Habakkuk, we see another piece of the puzzle of what it means to live by faith. And part of it is accepting God's decisions and judgments on any people, on any nation, anywhere. Living by faith is standing for justice and righteousness in a world gone mad with sin. This, this, this is how, how this all got started. Is Remember, Habakkuk said, I look around and I see all this evil in, in Judah. What are we going to do about it? And God says, this is what we're going to do. Habakkuk didn't shy away. He didn't rationalize it away. Say, oh, well, that's just, that's just what's going on. It doesn't matter. He stood up and brought it to God. And finally, as, as we will see next week, in chapter 3, living by faith in the book of Habakkuk requires trusting that the Lord will provide because he lives and because he does so in power. That's where, that's where we end in verse 20 here. God reigns. He is in his holy temple. He is above all. Let all keep silent before him. These are actions taken on behalf of our faith. Accepting God's decisions, standing for what he says is right, and trusting that he will provide. These are all actions taken 
Sometimes they're physical. Sometimes they're actions of the heart. But when we accept God, God's decisions and judgments, we will stand for justice and righteousness in the face of evil without terror keeping, it, keeping us from it. I want to encourage you to have courage because we know that God will provide for our greatest good. Whether or not what, what we're seeing with our eyes and, ex and experiencing right now are what we consider the best. God will lead us. He will guide us to what is best. Whether in this life or the next, because he is in his holy temple. And he reigns over all. We must be his to have the joy, to have the hope, to have the courage that he offers. And if we need to be his, then it's time to do it. And if we need to come back and trust in him, then it's time to do it. And it's, if it's time to stand up and say, I know where I've been and I know what I've done, but I serve a God who is loving and forgiving and who cherishes me. Not because I was so great, but because he's so great. Then it's time to live in that. I encourage you this week to stand for justice and truth and righteousness. And to do so in love and to do so in a way that shows that God is light, that God is love. Because that is how the world will know who he is. Let's stand and let's sing.